Let's pray. Father, we do thank you for the fact we can glorify you as our God and our Savior, as the one who created us, as the one who gave us choice to choose you, Father. And thank you that when we choose incorrectly, you still have a plan to save us and to correct us and to bring us back into your presence and to redeem us from our sin and our choice to be arrogant and selfish. And Father, I pray you open our eyes to your honor, your glory, to your grace, to your mercy, to the power of your presence. Draw us to you, Father, and speak to us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, today is Father's Day, and I don't often plan a sermon based on Hallmark card days. But it just so happened we ended Matthew last week. So rather than start what's next this week, I thought I'd wait a week and we could focus on Father's Day. And part of my reasoning is that we live in a culture that's done all it can do in the last 50, 60 years to erase dads as being important. The feminist movement, anti-man, anti-everything concerning male has done its best to remove dads from the family. And the federal government's done its best to step in and have welfare replace dads in the family. So there are many families that have mom, grandma, but no male presence whatsoever. And that has a very negative impact on our culture. Now Fox News website had an article, I think it was an opinion piece, but the guy listed several statistics that were interesting. Data from the United States Census Bureau shows that nearly 18.5 million children grow up without their fathers, which has in return led to the United States owning the title of the world's leader of fatherlessness, which means in the whole world, the most kids don't have dads live in America. That's because our culture created that. It's because our government paid people to be actually out of wedlock. No dad necessary. We know that fatherhood is essential to the development of our children and the increased involvement of fathers in the home leads to better results on a wide variety of outcomes, from economic prosperity, increased academic performance, to improved social mobility. Fathers in their respective homes continue to be a key indicator of success for all children across racial, ethnic, and socioeconomic groups. There is little doubt that America is experiencing an unprecedented fatherless crisis. Approximately 80% of single parent homes are led by single mothers, therefore leading to nearly 25% of our youth growing up without a father in the home. This staggering statistic has not only destroyed the nuclear family, nuclear family but has devastated communities across the nation. For example, 85% of children and teens with behavioral disorders come from fatherless homes. And over 70% of all adolescent patients in drug and alcohol treatment centers originate from homes without fathers. Fatherless youth eventually become adults who, without the structure of a two-parent household, struggle to gain their footing in the world. Beyond the enormous benefits to our children, there are numerous advantages in a society that result from a strong nuclear family. For example, regarding poverty, data shows such shows that children without a father in the home are five times more likely to live in poverty than a child in a two-parent household. Furthermore, research indicates that children without fathers at home are nine times more likely to drop out of school and represent 90% of all homeless and runaway children. Uh, I agree with the author. We can't ignore the fact that dads have been ignored in this country for too long, and that's part of the problem. All of our major cities have major gang issues, major gun violence issues, and they're caused by people who grew up in homes without dads. Uh, we have a one-time event in a school where several people are shot. That happens maybe now once a quarter, but every week the same number of people are shot in these cities, and nobody says a word. And they're being shot with gun violence, and nobody cares. It's not sensational enough, I don't guess. It's gangly, so they don't care. Often it's black on black, I guess they don't care about that either. It's sad. But the fact is, those communities are highlighted by the fact there are no father figures, there are no dads in the families. And our government created that culture bought and paid for that culture. And now we're facing the consequences of that. So my thought this morning would be, what is a definition of a biblical dad? What's the idea? What can we come up with? How would we describe an outstanding great dad? Well, in the Bible, there's really no text that says the Bible defines dad as this. There are many men in the Bible who are parents, but there really isn't great narrative stories 
about how they parented or how they were a great parent. We don't have anything about Adam parenting uh, Cain and Abel. And did he fail misery with Cain? Uh, I don't know that Moses was a great parent. He had children, but we don't have any record of how he parented or Isaac or Jacob or Abraham. Abraham maybe some because he had Isaac and loved him, obviously. Uh, Isaac failed because he loved Esau more than Jacob, had played favorites, that was a problem. So no great example of dad. David would be an outstanding failure example as a dad because, well, he was. Uh, he may have been after God's own heart, but he didn't care much about parenting, apparently, because he was a failure as far as parenting. So in the Bible, is there a really great example we can stand out and say, this is a great dad. Uh, maybe Joseph, Mary's husband, but we don't have enough information about him to focus on that. So instead, we'll focus on what makes a great man, because a great biblical man, once he becomes a dad, would he not be a great biblical dad? So you thought we'd be out of Matthew, but instead, turn to Matthew 22. <laughs> Matthew 22, beginning in verse 36. Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? And he said to them, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your all your mind. This is the great and foremost commandment. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. So this man asked Jesus, What is the single greatest statement in all of the Old Testament? Don't miss that. What is the greatest commandment? For them, that commandment comes from their Old Testament, which is our Old Testament pretty much the same books. So he asked Jesus, what is the one statement of all the books of the Old Testament, the law, the prophets, the wisdom literature, the historical literature, out of all of that, what is the single most important statement that you would say is the highest law? And when Jesus responds, he quotes Deuteronomy 6, 5, and he says, the greatest commandment is you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. So if you want to take all of the Old Testament and sum up in one statement, that's it. Love God. So the first characteristic of a great biblical dad would be he loves God. Well, that's easy. Let's move on. Is that easy? What does it mean to love God? How do I define loving God? Is it like loving Hershey's chocolate? Is that the same thing? Uh, is it like loving my dog or my cat, if you're that kind of person? Or I love my car, or I love my spouse, or I love my parents, or I love my children. How do I define loving God? And Jesus answers that question in the statement. He defines it with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. So look at those closely. The, the definition of a biblical dad is a man who loves God with all of his heart. Well, in, in their thought thinking process, the heart was the seat of the emotion. It's where you felt love, right? And if you get hurt today from someone you love, a, a death, or they leave, or whatever, you hurt literally in your chest. You have that heartbreak. We call it still today because that's where you feel it. So for them, the love, the passion was the heart. So with all your heart, we might define it better as emotion. With all your emotional being, you are to love God. Well, you let that set a little bit in your mind. If I'm going to love with all my heart, that is a definite feeling event. I have to have a definite, intimate, feeling, love, relationship with God. All my heart. All my emotion, I am to love God. It is a total pouring out, I think, of the feeling of the person emotionally. Of who I am emotionally. I am to be in love with God. And that really gives it that passion and that intimacy and that connection and that feeling, that good feeling. And that's what Jesus is saying. My love for God, my relationship with God should have feeling to it. It should have passion to it. It should have extreme closeness to it. After all, where is God? Well, he's in my heart. Right? I'm one with him. I am the temple of the Holy Spirit. He abides in me. My soul was crushed by my sin. God gave me a new spirit called the Holy Spirit. He's inside of me. So that love with all your heart is I am to make myself vulnerable to the presence of God in my life, which means all barriers are down, all masks are off. I am totally without anything but me standing before him, loving him. And I emphasize that because we don't do that with people. Do we make ourselves totally vulnerable, absolutely open 
even with our spouse, love them, give everything to them, open up to them, but there's still going to be things we don't totally release. And that's not a bad thing. I mean, you would think it'd be nice to have that kind of relationship. But in reality, I can't totally release because it's in here, you know? But God's in here with me, so I can totally release and be totally vulnerable to him because he knows it better than I do, most likely. So that is the picture that Jesus is saying. With all your heart, that total, absolute opening up to God and heart. And we should, I can say, we should feel something. And I think it should be so intimate and so passionate that it is obvious. A dad who I think is a good model of a biblical dad is someone who loves God, someone who obviously loves God. The world around him knows that man's in love with God. There's no doubt, there's no question, that's where his heart is. He loves his God. He loves his Savior. He walks with God. He walks with his Savior. So a great biblical dad is going to be one who loves God and definitely his kids know it. There's no question, there's no doubt in their mind, is my dad a believer? They know it because they see that love in him. Second, love with all your soul. And the soul, I think, is the spiritual aspect of life. Uh, when I die, the flesh, the body, goes in the ground and rots away. Dust to dust, it goes back to what it was. But the soul was a part of me that God created when I was conceived and lives for all eternity, either in heaven with him or in hell without him in misery. So the soul is, I think, actually who I am. It's the part that will be separated from the body at death, or for me, in my case, in the rapture. So my soul will be raptured out of my body, and my body will cease to exist. Uh, but that is the part that's who we are. I think that is really... The connecting part to the physical part is the soul. So I am to truly love God with my soul, all my soul. It is, I really am to give all of myself to him. I really am to love him with all that I am. And again, the Holy Spirit lives inside of me. I'm his temple. My love for God is should be the easiest love there is because he is in here with me. We connect spiritually, soul to spirit, spirit to spirit, however you want to, want to look at that. And that connection is unbroken. I can't be separated from God because he's one with me. I can't be separated from myself, and that's the whole idea. So with all my soul, all of the core of who I am, I am to love God. And I have to love him in such a way that everybody knows that my whole being is committed to God and my love for him. And then Jesus says, love with all your mind. And the mind obviously is the place of thoughts, ideas, plans, attitude, desires, worldview. Uh, that is our mind. And with all my mind, with all my thoughts, with everything that's in my mind, I am to love God. And that's the one that gets kind of tricky because everything that goes through my mind should be in relation to my love for God. My attitude about everything should be in relation to my love for God. My worldview is based on my love with God. If I love God with all my mind, then everything in my mind is subject to Him. It's submissive to Him and my love for Him and His love for me. It can't be separated. There can't be a business side and a God side. It all belongs to Him. And I've had people tell me, well, when you go to work, you don't go to work talking to God the whole time. you got to do your job. And my thought was, well, if God's in my heart, how can I not be with God the whole time? He's there with me. And yes, I can do the most delicate, tedious things as far as work goes and still be very aware of God with me and my love for him, his presence there. Whether I'm digging a ditch, he's thinking about God, or doing math, which would be really difficult for me, I can still be fully aware of and involved in my love for God and his love for me. And that's the idea. My whole mind is to be in love with God. When you think about that, that definitely has an effect on our character, our presentation of who we are, our lifestyle, what we do and don't do, because my mind is in love with God. And that also is a beautiful picture. Because in Paul's writings, he emphasizes surrendering it to God, being submissive in our thoughts to God, to be like Christ. And that's more of an act of, I must be obedient and do this. And that's part of it. But Jesus words it in, no, love God with your mind. Love God with your attitude. 
your passions, your desires, your worldview. That's a much more positive approach to obedience. It's out of love. It's through love because of my love to God and I, my desire to want to submit to Him and surrender to Him, be obedient to Him and walk with Him. And again, that is to be a very visible part of our life. The world should see that we love God. Our kids should see that we love God. There should be no doubt whatsoever. So the first characteristic is to love God of a biblical dad. The second characteristic is to love your spouse, your wife. In Matthew 22, we could go to verse 39. The second is like it, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And that would apply. We should love our spouse as ourselves. But God gives us a much more definitive definition of husband loving spouse in Ephesians 5 which we read often in this church because I always take the opportunity to emphasize the marriage relationship because it is vitally important to the believer and to his family. In Ephesians 5, beginning in verse 25, Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her, so that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, that he might present to himself the church in all her glory, having no, no spot or wrinkle, or any such thing, but that she would be holy and blameless. So husbands also, also love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his own wife loves himself, for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ also does the church, because we are members of his body. For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother, and shall be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Love your wife as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. This is a selfless love that sacrifices for his wife. Sacrifice that allow her to be sanctified, as the text says, and cleansed so that she might be presented to the husband having no spot or no wrinkle. And the picture is that the husband's input and love and uplifting and encouraging the wife in turn brings her back to him without spot or without wrinkle. And that's a part of God's design. If I am supporting and building up and nurturing and encouraging, I do get a return of my investment of my wife being that spotless, without wrinkle, beautiful spouse. And that's the picture that Paul's painting, that God's painting through him. Uh, sacrifices that build her up, glorify her, equip her to be God's best. And if my wife is God's best and she's my wife, then obviously that has a positive impact on me because I'm her husband and we are married. In verse 28, love her as your own body. Take care of her, cherish her, protect her physically, mentally, emotionally. Uh, make her that bride, that queen, as the church is to Christ. Christ does everything to build up the church. Christ does everything to save the church, cleanse the church, provide for the church, protect the church, present the church to himself as his bride. And Christ does not want some hag for his bride. He wants the most beautiful church there is. And the husband is to have that same attitude toward his wife. I will help make her the most beautiful wife she can be. There's my responsibility. There's my submission to the wife. So the husband, if he wants to be a great dad, needs to love his wife. And again, it should be obvious that he loves his wife. How do I make it obvious I love my wife? Work on that. My kids especially should know that I love my wife, that I love their mother, that there's no danger of me not being there for her or for them as dad. The third characteristic of a biblical dad is to love your kids. Again, there's no really great text that expound a lot on how to do that. But in Ephesians 6, verse 4, Paul writes, Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. He starts by saying, do not provoke to anger. So loving my children means I do not provoke them. How do I provoke my children? <clears throat> and I thought about that for a while, but it's not just picking at them like having fun or whatever, but how do I honestly, how does a dad provoke his children in a negative way? And my thoughts were neglect, being an absent dad, not being there to fulfill my responsibility as dad. Uh, bad advice, bad example. Obviously traded something other than them, more than them, a car, a career. 
a toy, a hobby, putting those things before my kids, disrespecting their mom would be provoking my children. I would think it's their mom. And if I mistreat her, that's because it's some issues. It should. It wouldn't be. Ignoring God would provoke my kids. Especially if I say to be a pastor of a church and I love God and then act differently away from church, away from the rest of the world, only my kids can see me. So all those things I think are examples of provoking my children to anger, to see a hypocrite. See someone who's dishonest. Being that bad example. So do not provoke to anger. So loving my kids is do not provoke them. Do not be a bad example for them. But then it says discipline them. Uh, and a great text about discipline happens to be found in the book of Hebrews, chapter 12, beginning in verse 4. Ring any bells for y'all? Have you not resisted to the point of shedding blood? You have not resisted to the point of shedding blood, and you're striving against sin, and you have forgotten the exhortation which is addressed to you as sons. My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor faint when you are reproved by him. For those whom the Lord loves, he disciplines, and he scourges every son whom he receives. It is for discipline that you endure. God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? But if you're without discipline, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Furthermore, we had earthly fathers who disciplined us, and we respected them, and shall we not much more rather be subject to the Father of spirits and live? So they disciplined us for a short time as seemed best to them, but he disciplines us for our good so that we may share his holiness. All discipline for the moment seems not to be joyful, but sorrowful. Yet to those who have been trained by it, afterwards it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness. And that actually is a great description of discipline. It is through love. The discipline is given. And for children who don't know right and wrong, who don't know what's best for them, that is the discipline of the parents. And a dad has the responsibility to discipline his children correctly. And primarily that means to point them to God, help them to walk with God, influence, encourage, lead them to walk with God. That's the most important discipline. Not so much trivial things or other actions that, yes, that's wrong, don't do that. But the most important thing is discipline them to walk with, seek to know, and be with God. If a dad loves his children and wants to be a good biblical dad, he will not provoke them and he will discipline them as the Bible says. And discipline, I think, is better described as correction because correction is pointing us in the correct direction. Um, and this is always should always be done in love. A most famous verse about children and parenting is Proverbs 13, verse 24. He who withholds his rod hates his son, but he who loves him disciplines him diligently. And of course, spare the rod, spoil the child is the idea behind the verse, but the verse does not really say that. Uh, the better Hebrew translation is he who withholds his correction or discipline, rather than rod. The idea that the Bible endorses beating your children with rods is not correct. The idea is the Bible emphasizes correct your children. Yes, don't let them get away with things that are wrong. Don't let them do what they want to do. If a rod is necessary, by all means, beat the stew out of them. Uh, no, the Bible doesn't say that either. <laughs> But sometimes it may be you have to grab hold of your child and get his attention to correct him. The point, though, is not legitimizing beating your children. No, it is making sure that you are correcting them, disciplining them, because children need that. In my experience, it's been children want that. They want to be given direction. They want to know right from wrong. They want someone to hold them accountable. So when they become teenagers, they lose that, and then it's too late. If you haven't done it before they're five years old, you've probably lost them. If you wait till they're teenagers, it's too late. They're gone. So by all means, the Bible is correct. Correct your children. Discipline your children. Point them the way to go. 
both in to, to God as well as how to relate to each other, how to share, how to be polite, all that stuff. Correct them, discipline them. And let them know why you're doing it. Let your children know that you're correcting them because you love them. You want what's best for them. I don't want my kids to be drug addicts, so I teach them accordingly. I don't want to be bank robbers. I teach them accordingly. I don't want them to, to fall out and have diseases or whatever. I teach them and correct them accordingly. And the Bible tells me to do so. A characteristic of a great biblical dad is one who disciplines, who corrects. Who parents, actually. That is parenting. So for the Bible to define dad would be a man who loves God, loves his spouse, and loves his kids. And make sure that the world knows it. And our culture, our society today needs to see biblical dads being dads. Because there are so many that are not. Let's pray. And Father, I pray you will open our eyes to the truth and the reality of our responsibility as believers to serve you, to walk with you, and to be an example of what it means to know you and serve you and walk with you. And I pray, Father, for our families that are represented here, that you'll be with us, be with all of us, strengthen us and encourage us in our responsibilities as husband, as wife, as mother, as father, as children. I pray, Father, you will motivate us to seek you, pursue you, to serve you where you placed us and our families for your honor and your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <laughs>